Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by Mr. Rob Hart of robhartdrumstudio.com. Rob, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Bart. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. And this is cool because this is like a, a series we're working on where it's it's the Mentors series where we are listening to recordings that you uh, recorded yourself when you took lessons which, with some of the best drummers in the world. Um we did Steve Smith last time. Today we're doing Mike Clark. There's a list of others we've done. Uh, you did an episode in the past uh, about Tony Williams, where you recorded a clinic and broke that down a little bit as we listened to, to clips. So you've been recording these drum lessons um, for for a very long time. So I think it's smart what you've done of just of working with all these great different different drummers. I'll link in the description. You can see, I guess we'll call it part one of this series was Steve Smith. Lots of cool clips. Um, so that'll be there, uh, for people to check out. So Rob, can you explain, um, he's very active still. Let's talk about Mike Clark. He's on social media. He has been for, for years, ever since I got into this world of, you know, social media and, you know, the drum posting drum clips and stuff. Mike Clark is a phenomenal drummer. He, I know you mentioned to me that he likes to be referred to as a jazz drummer, but man, he can play some funk funk and swing and he has just an all-around incredible style of drumming and is just an interesting guy in general so can you give a maybe for people who aren't familiar with them just kind of a quick synopsis of of who mike clark is and his importance in the uh, drum world yeah so mike clark um really innovated there was a bay area um sound going on and uh david garibaldi uh tower of power you know, same like David David Garibaldi innovated this whole you know uh, linear funk thing that was you know legendary. Well, Mike was around at that same time, so um, they innovated you know the East Bay funk sound, and so um, his legendary track was uh, what was called Actual Proof on an album by uh, Herbie Hancock called Thrust. And that album is actually so amazing. Like every groove, everything on that album, you know, is is it's so amazing. It's it's like funk, but it's improvised jazz at the same time. So um, the story is that when he did the uh, actual proof, you know, it was uh, you know he's Buddhist. I'm Buddhist too. Uh, he tells the story about uh, uh, doing the chanting and going back. Um, cause they told them not to play. They wanted to play something really corny, you know? So the story was, is that he went and excused himself for 20 minutes, did some chanting meditation, if you will. He came back and he only had one, one chance to do the take. They were like, mm. I'll give you one chance. That was the producer. If you don't get it, that's it. You know, we're moving on. We're going to do the Pressure. other style. He yeah. did it in one take. And then he he kind of said, I'm going to, this is going to be something that's going to change the world. This is, he kind of had this vision that this is, this is something that's going to be legendary. And so that kind of what happened with that track, it's, it's this improvised thing that go into all these different, uh, like feels and grooves. And, you know, um, it just, it goes all over the place, but it's, there's a form, right? And actually the, the if you've ever played that or know that tune, I mean, I've, I played it in my trio. It's a hard tune. It's there's there's some you know it's it's kind of these rhythms that are stretched out and you know it's sure. got some like two over three and all these different things and my friend would transcribe it as a bar of five four or, you know it's it's kind of crazy but yeah you know he did that in one take so you know um, Mike just he he innovated um, the linear style of funk and. Um, I guess you could say he was sampled later on, like the most sampled drummer, along wow. with like the James Brown stuff and all that. Um, and um, he wasn't like a hard hitter or anything like that, but he just had like a certain touch and feel and style. Um, the other thing that that happened, he played in a lot of organ bands. So he had a really great swing feel and a really nasty shuffle. Like his shuffle, I've seen him play... Um, with organ trios before, and the shuffle is just out of this world. Um, so, yeah. you know, he he grew up in, you know, I think a time when, you know, straight ahead jazz was popular. And then he also grew up in a time when R&B and blues and everything was popular. 
Sure. Uh, his dad was a drummer, so his dad used to take him around everywhere. And so uh, he was like a child prodigy. He would sit in with everybody. He told me that uh, uh, in Sacramento, uh, he uh, grew up in a kind of a, a poverty-stricken neighborhood. And and the kids liked him because he would play drums for the kids. They'd come over to his his house and he'd play like, you know, drum grooves and the kids would dance for him. <laughs> so, you know, he, he was just a child prodigy legend. Um, you know, innovated drumming with with uh, with Herbie Hancock, uh, and just you know he's kept playing all the way, and he's uh, what seventy six. He's still playing. I just saw him play about um, a month ago up in San Francisco. Yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, he's there's something very special, and I didn't really realize the child prodigy part of it, which makes perfect sense. It seems like there's a freedom to it, and like I said before, incredible jazz drummer. But there's there's a video that's kind of famous that's. Um, uh, Mike Clark and Paul Jackson, who are playing, and it's it's labeled as funk and swing grooves, and the full thing is up on um, YouTube, which I don't know who owns the rights to it. That's they can figure all that out, but I can uh, try to link to the to it in the description. You can find it pretty easily. It's an hour long, but man, he can play, and that's again his funk side of things. Also, an incredible jazz drummer. Um, but so we'll jump into the clips here because I think it's awesome to hear this idea, which is you get full credit for of just listening to these clips and breaking it down is so cool. But um, you mentioned that you took a lesson or two with him, but then you guys really just became friends beyond that. Is that correct? Yeah. So I went to my, there was a keyboard player and his wife and his name is uh, Jeff Pitson and Suzanne Pitson. And they had a um, an apartment in San Francisco and they were good friends with Mike. So they would say, hey, Mike is going to be teaching at the house, at the apartment, once you come over and take a lesson. So um, what I did is, like I said, I tape everything. So I taped that lesson, and it was the first time I met him. And I think I, they were playing a gig in San Francisco, and I hung out with him a little bit um, at, you know, before that lesson. But um, this recording is from that, that very first meeting, or very really? first lesson, I should say. Okay, cool. So this is number one here labeled audition. Is that correct? Yeah. So so what's going to happen is he he sits down with me and he says, okay, let's hear you play. You know, um, I just want to go through some different styles and and see where you're at. Uh, I'm not going to judge you or anything like that. You know, don't don't even worry that I'm here. Just just, you know, play a few things and, and then I can kind of make an assessment. So this is clip number one, uh, Mike Clark. Uh, last thing, what year are we looking at right now? Is this ninety two? Yeah, nineteen ninety two. And by the okay. way, this is me playing. This is this is him going. Okay, go. You know, let me hear you. Let me see. Got let it. me see what you got and go. And so it's me playing. Okay, Rob Hart playing. Mike Clark listening. First time hearing him. So let's check this out. Let me hear you play. Just make yourself comfortable and play anything you feel. Don't worry about me checking you out and all that stuff. Okay. Just, you know, get down and play by play some jazz things for me for a while. And then we'll play some fun, you know. And then we'll play some Latin stuff, okay? All right. Just, yeah, just give it right now, just play some jazz. Then we'll try medium tempo, okay? Just be, you know, whatever you feel. And now see what I can do. How did he react? What was his response then after you played? Um, I don't quite remember, but you know, we just went through a few things, and and he kind of gives me like a an assessment after. Yeah. Um, which I think I have on some of the recordings, but he says, "Oh yeah, you got to work on your phrasing. I, I I think you got the goods, but you know, you need to work. You, it, it sounds all jumbled. You need to work on." making everything, uh, you know, more articulated or more clear. Sure. Which you sounded great, but that we've all been in that position where it's like, sit down and do it now. That audition yeah. process is always a little, uh, you know, 
stressful, even though that's it's it's labeled as audition, but you're not really you're just kind of letting them hear you. It's not like you're at a, you know, on a stage doing a big audition. But I will say just even from hearing him talk and I've heard him on social media and stuff, Mike seems like a really cool guy. He seems like a very nice, nice guy. I mean, and a great, great person to take lessons from. Yeah, he's a he's a uh, amazing human being, you know, yeah. um, and, and he'll sit and talk to you forever. And I was saying, uh, I was telling you off uh, off the interview that I was talking to him for an hour yesterday and we'll just go, you know. Um, yeah. So uh, he's he's just one of those, you know, that you go to a gig and show up and he'll just hang and and and, uh, uh, you know, he's just uh, he's got that sense of of you know, just feels, makes you feel really, really, really comfortable. And just, yeah. you know, you know, it's just the, you know, that, that kind of personality that, that, you know, very loving, you know, and, and, sure. and very supportive. Yeah. Um, so you were in your friend's apartment or his friend, your mutual friend's apartment. What do you yeah. remember what the drum set was? I know he's a yeah. DW guy. What were you playing? Gretsch. Oh, cool. Okay. And so there's another drummer in San Francisco, uh, which is his best friend, uh, Vince Ladianto. Vince Ladiano. And then um, uh, they would, whenever Mike was in town or something, uh, he would just give him a kit. Or, you know, if he was doing a gig, they'd loan him a kit and all that. So nice. uh, it was a beautiful Gretsch, Gretsch kit. And I believe it was like K Zildjian's or something. I actually I listened to that recording. It's like, wow, those drums sound great. Yeah, they do. Very clear and cutting and, and everything. And and same thing we did with the Steve Smith. What was your recording setup for this? Was this your Walkman? Yeah. The Walkman. It's, same it's, one. <laughs> <laughs> that thing is a tank. <laughs> it is. Yeah. All right. Anything else we should know about number one here? I mean, uh, the first clip, I think uh, like so you carried on, you did the lesson, he gave you a little bit of advice. Um, yeah. Anything else we should know? Well, and he's just um, playing for him a little bit. He's getting a sense. He's checking you out, you know, looking at your technique or whatnot. And, uh, you know, just yeah. trying to go through some different styles. Sure. Well, should we jump in and hear the next one then? Yeah. So the next one is Bright Swing. Okay. Uh, let's play it and then maybe explain a little bit more about it after. So here's Bright Swing. <laughs> That sounded great. You sounded a little more warmed up there. So Mike is sitting there watching. I'm sure he's, uh, yeah. Explain the situation with that one. Um, yeah, I mean, we're he's going through like play um, a medium swing like the first one, then mm -hmm. play play up swing, um, play a samba, you know, um, play some funk. Uh, so he's going through like the list. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, he's and I remember that I was I was you could hear like that Tony Williams a little bit of that copying in there a little trying to trying to play some of those licks. So sure. I guess I was um, you know around because I was studying with Tony at that time too. Mm. Um, so I was around that that time and 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 playing some of that stuff. So um, so yeah, I mean he's just going through different styles and it's just you know let's see what you can do. All right, that's a cool one. So moving forward here. So the next one is the roles. So this is kind of tied into the Tony Williams episode too about the importance of roles. Yep. So he says, "Let me hear your role." Okay. And uh, play me, play me a single stroke role. Play, let's 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 hear your double stroke role. You know, um, let's hear your single stroke role. Like where where, where you're at. You know, and yep. he says, "Roles are important." Okay. Well, let's roll this clip. <laughs> It 
sure is. You know, so let me hear you do Yeah, I work on that shit a lot. Oh, I can dig it, too. Yeah. Yeah. single how's your single nice so you got a little that sounded great so you got a little uh pat on the back from mike that has to feel good yeah you know i i think the, the i don't know how you feel or your viewers feel that the double stroke role is actually i think one of the hardest roles uh yeah. second being the single stroke role and then the buzz roll, I think people kind of get. Now, I've been teaching for like 40 years, and I feel like buzz roll, people kind of understand. I mean, maybe it's not smooth, but they kind of yeah. get the function of it, right? Sure. But the double stroke roll is one of those, either you get it or you don't. They don't get the whole um, getting the bounce catch technique and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know how you feel about that, but I just feel that role, being able to play a double stroke role, um smoothly is probably the most challenging rudiment uh as far as the long roll family yeah so he was kind of having me do that and see what i how i could play that but one of the gifts i had when i was a young kid i was able to do that i was able to i got the bouncing concept down yeah 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 know? which kind of is the feeling in your hands which i feel like that's hard to explain to people when you're teaching a lesson sometimes of like you're teaching a feeling of feeling the bounce and all that stuff. And and I would agree. I feel like double strokes are something that you can just work on endlessly. And they're once you get them down, they're fun to do and to practice. And it's it's rewarding because it sounds impressive. There's something about the double stroke that's just ripping, but it's playing it in the middle. It's playing it up higher. It's playing it soft. It's There's a lot, so many different variations. And, uh, you know, it's nice when he said, yeah, that sounds great or whatever he said. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's uh, you know being able to play that smoothly, uh, you know, with intensity, and and you said like different dynamics. There's like so many different ways in the snare drum that you get different sounds, you know, different yeah. tones, you know, by the yeah. rim, and then moving out towards the middle and all that. So um, that's kind of what I was doing. And I think I went down to a buzz too. Sure. Yeah, yeah, going from double to buzz and then back to the double and then slowing it down. And that's what I did with Barry James when I was taking lessons with him was working on that. And, and uh, and you know, again, you can work on something for your entire life and then sit with a different teacher and then they show you something you might not be doing. That's a cool way to practice it or something that's uh, that's pretty neat. So, uh, all right. So let's we got next Mike Clark Funk Fusion. What's this one? So. Mike started playing some funk stuff and then he kind of started, he went to a thing where he sped it up and um, I labeled it funk. And then, and then when he, I, I was uh, uh, giving him the clip so he could check it out, you know, to give me the, okay. He goes, man, that's not funk. That's like fusion stuff. And I want to remind people that Mike did play with brand X, mm -hmm. you know, um, he's on, I think he's on a product album and, um, uh, he told me that was like the hardest gig he ever did because it's, really? you know, it's, it's, it's all crazy fusion stuff, uh, which he sounds great on, by the way. Sure. Um, so I think that track is kind of geared towards, you know, a little bit of the fusion uh, aspect. So it's a little bit faster. It's kind of the, you know, uh, up-tempo funk fusion. Yeah. Well, We'll play it, but I mean, he was born in, I think, 46, so when he's coming up and in like, you know, 70s are kind of his heyday of like a lot of these huge bands, that was a really weird time of funk becoming fusion and jazz was changing, so he has a, he was definitely at the right place at a very interesting time, uh, which I think translates to a lot of these interesting, you know, styles and his, his ability to play so many different things, um, so... All right, here we go. Mike Clark, uh, Funk, Fusion, you be the judge here. Let's listen to it. Here we go.
That was awesome. What was your thoughts? So you guys, you guys then switched and he sat down. Yeah. So he was playing at that point and, um, you could hear him playing it, a you know, fast tempo and then he slowed it down. Um, and that's definitely like a linear pattern. Mm-hmm. And then for the listeners, a linear just means you don't hit anything at the same time. You're not hitting any two limbs together. So everything's, yeah. everything's separated. And then plus yeah. that open hi-hat stuff, you know, uh, getting that real clean and, um, that's a voice. So, um, he was demonstrating that. And sure. I want to say too, when I talked to him, um, yesterday, he was mentioning that, uh, when he developed the funk stuff, it was, he said that he was playing mercy, mercy, mercy by Joe Zalinol, like that, that tune. And he said, that's when he started kind of developing the style. Right. And, and he started experimenting and, 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 uh, and then kind of like all this stuff came out. And I think Paul Jackson, too, you know, he was a very unique bass player. Right? Yeah. I don't think he yeah. gets enough credit. But he no, had but his the, own two to- sound. the two of them together is. Are, oh, yeah. And, and yeah. they were like, you know, they were, they were tight, you know, yeah. just, just as friends. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Lug Guitars. Lug is reimagining kids' guitars. I have had this acoustic guitar in my house for probably two years now, and this thing is awesome. I love playing it. Uh, for those of you listening and not watching on YouTube, it is a really, really cool, red, awesome-looking guitar, very high quality. This thing, I don't recommend this, but it has been thrown around, stepped on, dropped, and it's, it stays in tune through all that, let alone doesn't break or anything like that. Very high quality. Recently, we got um, a electric guitar, which I believe is the pro electric guitar from Lug. Lug is great about having different apps that you can use. There's little flashcards that have fun little monsters on them that keep kids engaged. Everything about Lug is very high quality and fun for kids to learn guitar. Um, obviously, this is a drum podcast, so you'd think we want our kids to be drummers, but sometimes they want to be guitarists. But it's also fun to just build out your band room with kids' instruments so you can jam with your kids. I know my son likes to play the guitar, and he'll just jump around and play one of the guitars and just scream and sing while I'm playing the drums, and it is a ton of fun. It's like something we do every night here in my house. So check out lugguitars.com slash drumhistorypodcast to see everything on the Lug website, lugguitars.com slash drumhistorypodcast, and uh, you guys are going to love these if you get them for your kids. So. Thanks to Lug for sponsoring the podcast. All right, so we got Mike on the kit, and then next up we have Gotta Hear You with a Band. You want to describe this one a little bit? Yeah, so what's happening is is you're, we're taking a drum lesson, and he's, you know, we've gone through the audition process. You know, there was like a, we did some Latin things and, and whatnot. Um, and then he goes, you know, it's okay to hear you in the uh, practice room or in, in, in the studio or in the, you know, um, just, just playing the drum set was for somebody, but he yeah. goes, you know what? Like, I haven't heard you with a band. Like I can't judge you until I actually hear you with a band. And, um, and so I'm like, yeah, that makes sense because when I grew up, I played to records and, and so I would put the needle back and try to learn that section. And I thought it was like, I thought I could play. Right. I thought it was, like I learned all this stuff from the record. And then when I started playing with people, like, you know, acoustically, uh, <laughs> like I found out differently, like I, I couldn't yeah. play at all. Like I, I had <laughs> no skills at all. Like you, it's like night and day. So different thing when you're playing, when you, when you're on the gig and, um, and, and, and somebody's hearing you play in the ensemble situation, that's really where you can get, you know, uh, a judgment of like how you play. Yeah. Right. Now, guys, you know, can play like they can support the band by not playing anything. Some guys know how to excite the band, as Buddy Rich would say, um, lift all the other band members up. Um, some guys know, you know, how to interact with the band in jazz, like, you know, how to do a, a, a conversation. Sure. Um, some guys listen, some guys don't, you know, so there are all these things that tie into hearing you play, you know, in an ensemble or with a band. Yeah. Totally. Okay, let's hear this and we'll talk about it more. Here you go. Gotta hear you with the band. Work on your phrasing, you know what I mean? I mean, I can't tell because I haven't heard you with a band. I'm just hearing you by yourself with, you know, some strange drum set. So, you know, I can dig all that. But, but, um, but like, let me show you some stuff, okay? Let me show you some easy stuff. It's not, it's not technical. It's not what you think. Okay. Like, 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 Solid beat. 
soul only, not on the gig. So you want the beat to lift up and dance and move forward. <laughs> I think it's cool too that he knows exactly what he started off by saying is like I'm just hearing you on some random drum set meaning that you've never played on this you're not really that comfortable on it again he understands that because it's like if you sit on someone's set and then like it's just like I've even had that at like you know you go to a family party and there's a drum set that some kid is set up that's just like uh, and then you kind of sit on it and it's I'm speaking of a very specific example but it was like all right I'm gonna play and there's a group of people watching me and it's like this isn't what I sound like. I'm on a random drum set playing by myself. Uh, but he he gets that, which you obviously played phenomenally. But um, yeah, he, he understands that. It's a whole different beast when you're playing with a band on your own drums and you're grooving and it's uh, you're in your element. That's that's a different story. Yeah, um, I think it's that. And, and, you know, being being in the situation where you're playing for somebody that you're you're, you're meeting for the first time, like in an intimate um setting and uh yeah you know all those those kind of things like doing a, i guess a job interview in a way sure you know and you're nervous do i say the right things do i play the right things yeah so um so he's saying that the other thing he's saying is that you know hey i know that we're here in this room and this is happening but um i haven't heard you with the band but i'm sure that when you're playing with the band it's going to be you know different right and then yeah. see if you're, you, you know, it, how you play and, and how you, uh, you know, how you react in, in an ensemble situation. Yeah. I mean, there's drummers who are great solo clinician drummers um, who maybe don't excel playing in a band because they kind of are overdoing it or everything's about them versus someone who plays great in a band like Charlie Watts. You probably wouldn't he wouldn't sit down and play drum solos and do clinics by himself, but he's perfect for the stones kind of thing, you know, it's, it's, it's two different mindsets. Um, and I, I've always, I've kind of thought about it too, of like, there's like, and this is, it might be a stretch, but there's like stand up comedians who are funny by themselves on a stage. And then there's an actor who's funny when they're with a group of people and they, they play off each other. You know what I mean? It's kind of like drummer by himself versus drummer in a band. Yeah. And some of those drummers, uh, that are legendary, like Ringo and Charlie and, you know, they just play the right stuff. And and it's, yeah. again, in the ensemble situation. Um, I remember seeing Alan White. It was an Alan White clinic at Guitar yeah. Center in, in, in San Francisco or, or El Cerrito. It was horrible. Really? It was horrible. But it's he doesn't do that. That's not his thing. Yeah. He doesn't play by himself. He doesn't do solos or play with tracks. That's not what he does. But, man, yeah. in the I've seen him with, with Yes – incredible you know incredible yeah <laughs> amazing like he yeah. had that gig down right so that's um, a great example yeah and i want to say too you know we're in an age where i think everybody's doing instagram videos and all that um i kind of see a lot of the same thing where there's there's like i don't know if you call it drum and bass or uh you know like like uh gospel chops sometimes we call it gospel chops um yep. and then like, what's it like if you put those people, like, if they're actually playing in a musical situation? Like, what is that going to be like? So, um, Mike Johnston, I think he, he talks a little bit about that, you know, with his lessons of, of like, oh, you know, doing these Instagram videos and, oh, look at all these guys are so much better than me. I even watch that stuff and I go, wow, this is incredible. But yeah. what, what if you put those people in a musical situation where they have to play, you know, um, you know certain styles of music? In the gig, you know, people probably turn around and go like, take it easy. You know, like you don't need to do that all the time. It's more about leave room for the guitar and bass and singer and keys, you know, like a Charlie Watts thing or a a Charlie Watts thing. They just know like they grew up playing in bands and they know what to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And and it makes the band sound great. You know, they they lift the band up. Like Mike says, it lifts the band up because they know exactly what to do. So, so you're not really paying attention to the drummer so much, but you're paying attention to the band, you know, the vocals, you know, the groove. But the other side of it is when you're sitting down at a kit, at a lesson, let me hear what you got. 
you you want to show him some chops and stuff like that. But but it's interesting because he he knows that again. He's he's a very I feel like he's a pretty straightforward guy who who understands and is uh, I'd say it's it shows some like empathy too of like I get it you know you're great but I understand you'll be in a different situation and you'll be playing with a band and it's it's hard to get that that out so he understands what's going on there which is really cool to hear um, so up next we have number six uh, when you get to the gig what are we he- going to hear here so he's going to say that all the stuff that he does all his his repertoire. He plays at the gig. So um, there can be things when you practice something, but you never use it. So a lot of my students, uh, you know, you might go through all this material um, and it's really hard and you practice it, but you can never use it. Right. It's it's all this sure. this this crazy stuff that uh, is fun to practice and whatnot. But maybe you, it, there's no use for it on on a, in a musical setting. So what Mike yeah. is saying is like, I use everything I do on the gig. I use everything, you know, my complete oh, cool. repertoire I can, I can use in, in uh, my musical situations. Pretty neat. Okay. Let's check this one out. Cause the whole thing is like, when you get to the gig, that's when it counts. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, the drum that's, room is one thing, you know, but then the gig, that's another that's thing. That's what I'm talking about. I know. See, you get to the gig and you can't do any of that stuff. It's unmusical. I can do all my shit at the gig. Right. I swear. But but a lot of times, like with with a lot of stuff that you can practice, like you said, you're a, you're a practicaholic. It, it's great in the practice room, and you think you're great. And you get to the gig, and, you and, and it's, it. there's no proof. You right. know, it's, yeah. it's, it's like you can't use it, and then it's uh, it's it's unmusical. Yeah. And what what good is that? Very interesting. I mean, how how do you explain? And I'm asking you through him to think about it. You know what I mean? Like, I, how would you do that? How would you translate everything he practices he can do at the gig versus what you were just saying about, yeah, we all get that. You practice things that you'd never play live, but he's saying, I do everything <laughs> at the gig. I can do everything. It, it, just kind of go through that a little bit. How does, how do you think he, he gets to that point? Well, he, uh, so playing all the, in all the situations he's done, you know, and so all his his you know repertoire vocabulary um he can he can it's all applicable yeah and so he's not doing things for the sake of of um you know being able to play fast or you know being able to play some some groove or uh, you know some kind of thing i know i practice things that i never use i forgot right you you, yeah. you, you go through books and you know it's it's like maybe it's fun or something like that but you just you forget it right away. Does you never? Yeah. It's like it's like okay, that was cool. And I you always used to tell my students, it's like, you know, if you're going to practice something, got to do it over and over again until you you digest it. It's it's got to be part of you that you remember. I remember I remember lessons that I took from my teachers. It's still in me. Like I can remember that, and I can I can um, I could play it right. So sure. I've actually just did a. a, a a tribute lesson uh, for uh, Robbie Gonzalez, and I played one of his licks. You know, from it was like nineteen eighty, like three or something like that. And I could remember it, and I remember the phrase. And I had to just work on the independence a little bit, but like yeah. I, I can remember all this stuff from doing it over, and over, and over and over in repetition. And when sure. you do that, and you what I call digesting it, then that becomes part of your vocabulary instead of doing something once. Oh, and moving on, doing it once, moving on. So a lot of the stuff is like developing your ideas uh, and then um, using those ideas in a, in a musical situation, right? So you're yeah. not forgetting it. You're not just doing stuff that you, you, you forget and it was good one day, but you give up. Um, yeah. And the other thing about, I, I call it like the daily routine, uh, is that when you start to do uh, an idea or a... a, a um, you know, a, uh, a practice, a, a practice, uh, um, subject, you have to keep developing that subject over time, right? Sure. A little bit every day, even if it's like 10 minutes, you're developing that subject and, and that idea. And then the idea starts to get like, you start to develop. I don't know if you have that thing where like first day, it's horrible. Oh Second yeah. Day, like you're so fresh. Like I'll never get this second day. <laughs> yeah. It's a little better. 
Yeah. You know, third day starts to come together. Um, and then, you know, by the end, like maybe it's a month later, it's like, oh, wow, I, I wonder why I thought this was hard. All right. So next we have throwing fives. Is this you or Mike playing on this one here? Okay. So this one uh, is Mike. And um, I actually renamed uh, that bebop phrasing. So Mike okay. is playing some bebop stuff and it's it's amazing. So this is kind of Mike and his element, you know, going for his thing. And I want to say that um, when when Mike would come over and he came to my parents' house, by the way, and there was a bass player who was a, a, actually the first bass player that played my trio, John Watala. And John was playing with Mike at this place called Pearls in, in San Francisco in North Beach. And so John would bring Mike over and we're all, we're all Buddhists, you know? So, uh, Mike would, uh, we would chant in my bedroom for three hours. That was our wow. thing. And, and you feel really good after you bring your, you know, you get like a high off of it, you know, so you feel really good. And, and then, uh, Mike would go into my had My brother's bedroom was my studio at the time. So I built a little studio in my brother's bedroom and I had two kits and he would just be like a kid. You go check out this Philly Joe lick. Check out this, boom, boom, and then there, here's this lick, boom, boom, boom. Oh yeah, and this is the Art Blakey lick, boom, 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 and he just starts <laughs> showing, just just playing all this stuff. So you kind of hear like a glimpse of this and this bebop phrasing of of like all that history, you know, and it's cool. just so amazing. I mean, just like you talked about with the with the development, like a, a Philly Joe thing, like like yeah. hearing his rudiments. And how yeah, yeah, clean yeah. they were, and how amazing, and 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 you know the articulation, and you know the phrasing, and all that. So that's what this this uh, clip is about. Okay, cool. Let's check it out. We talked about how uh, Tony Williams and and various other drummers are like masters of like, you know, they could mimic and pull out other drummers styles similar to what you just said. Is that Mike like you like, is he very, very good at just like like this is this is how this drummer plays. This is how this drummer plays. Is that kind of one of his specialties? I don't think so, but he he has his influences and then he kind of throws some of the stuff in. He kind of incorporates it. Sure. But in fact, you know, we were talking about this yesterday. Um, so some drummers want to sound like their, um, you know, mentors, right? Or, or their, where, where they got their, their, you know, influences from. And sometimes they just play that way, right? Like they, mm -hmm. they just like, okay, the, you know, they're, they're influenced by this drummer and you can tell like they just play exactly like that drummer or they play like this style and this drummer and they play exactly like that drummer. Um, we talked about like how uh, when you're playing, you know, the instrument in a, in a kind of higher level, you start to develop your own characteristic style. Yeah. You know? So I think in a way he was influenced by, you know, everybody happening at the time, you know, with the, you know, the, the magnificent seven, right. Um, of, of the bebop era. But at the same time, he he was you know developed his own thing, and yeah. And so, well, can you I explain the Magnificent Seven while while you're saying that? What is what what are you referring to there? That Magnificent Seven is the Lenny White uh, Masters of the Day, and I'm gonna have to pull it up if you don't mind. Okay. I'll pull it up <laughs> sure. and I'll read it off to you. Yeah, 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 sure. So Lenny White, um, who's another one that I think doesn't get a lot of recognition. Um, yeah, and Incredible him and Mike drama. are best friends. You know, they're oh, cool. like tight and they talk yeah. to each other every day. And uh, by the way, Lenny White got a lot of people gigs, you know, he got Steve Smith, the gig with uh, Steps Ahead. You know, he uh, he 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 gets people like hanging out like you get gigs just from being around in the drummer circle. But Lenny White oh, was, cool. you know, he is a, a master. Right. 
who could yeah. play bebop, he could play fusion, he can play funk, he could play rock. You know, um, he he is one of those guys that can really do it all. He's, cool. he's like the the master, the the you know founding father. So, yep. Magnificent Seven, uh, one Max Roach, two uh, Roy Haynes, three Elvin Jones, four Kenny Clark, five Philly Joe Jones, six Tony Williams, seven Art Blakey. Man, I didn't know if it. I mean, it makes the list is exact is is correct. I didn't know it was referred to as that, and it makes perfect sense. I didn't want to just blow past it and go, "Oh yeah, Magnificent Seven. I'm glad it's a good category for it. That's that's the the Godfathers of 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 this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, unbelievable. Um, all right, so we're up to our last clip. Um. Let's see. It's I have it labeled as I think we have some different labels, but what other styles do you play? So is this just him kind of questioning, like, let's hear some other stuff that you do? Actually, I'm questioning him. Oh, wow. Okay, okay so cool. I go, okay, so so what other things do you do? And then he started playing kind of a, a, a another uh, what we call biome uh, uh, Brazilian groove. Yeah. So he started playing some of that, but it was me saying, what other styles do you play? Yeah, that's cool. Good question. Sometimes it's good to question the master you know so uh all right let's check this out and then we'll uh we'll close it out after that and kind of finish up and hear more about rob hart and his drums studio and everything like that so um here we go number eight sure so um so what do you think about like um what what kind of styles do you play you know well what do you mean like like um well i play um so you we covered like some of the jazz phrasing up up stuff yeah and uh, and, and the uh the some of the funk and the bio yeah, yeah. and and the samba thing yeah. what other sambas do you play well like I let's play, say somebody kind of something yeah i play this song i love One. this song oh. yeah. Not bad. <laughs> Sounded pretty good. He he answered your question very clearly. That uh, I think I feel like he could play. He could play anything. You know. Yeah. Yeah. How'd you feel after hearing that? Yeah. So that was like a wall and co thing. Um, you know, which is beautiful groove. Beautiful. Yeah. You know yeah. that that groove is actually really hard to play. I think it comes from the the congas. You know, that kind of thing. Sure. And then trying to play that on the kit. Um, yeah, it was beautiful. You know, so um, from this point out, you know, um, we just started hanging out. Like I said, you know, uh, he would come over to the house and I would go to Pearl. So that that club I talked about uh, and and he would just have me sit in like he would he would just call he, he would just call your name and you'd go sit in, which is that's like the test, you know, yeah, go up and play. Yeah, and it was all the like San Francisco cats. Uh, my friend was playing bass most of the time. John, um, I remember one time in, in the girlfriend that I was going out with at the time, we were at Peter Erskine playing. Peter Erskine was playing with uh, uh, Elaine Elias, the Brazilian uh, piano player. And uh, it was at a, a club in the East Bay called Kimball's East. And, and I wanted to hear Erskine play. You know, I just wanted to. That, that stuff was beautiful, right? I think it was Mark Johnson on bass. And I just wanted to stay for the, you know, the whole night. And my girlfriend's like, no, we're going to go, we're going to go to hear Mike. We're going to go, we're going to go to the, we're going to go to Pearls. And I was like, not really wanting to do that. And then we went down to Pearls. Like we drove across the, uh, the, the Bay Bridge was going from, um, the East Bay to the, to, to San Francisco. And, uh, and then we went down there. She was like, oh, you're going to sit in. I'm like, oh, I don't really want to sit in right now. It's like, oh, no, you're <laughs> going to sit in. And then uh, it was something where I counted the two. Like, it was some weird count off thing that was like, got real funny, right? Got weird, right? Yeah, I yeah, got, yeah. I got pissed. And then I started just like, when you're in that weird kind of thing of not being nervous, now you're kind of angry because you just made a mistake. Yep. 
And then I started playing some stuff. Like something happened. Like it changed my playing. Like I, I was kind of a little bit uh, more aggressive, I guess you'd say. Sure. And then Mike man. goes, oh, man, I like that. what did you do there, man? Oh, I liked that when you were playing, you know? <laughs> It and, worked and out they, that he liked he it. He was again. saying, like, I know what happened. Like, you counted the tune. Like, he was trying to, like, tell me what happened with, like, like the, the, the little train wreck at the beginning. But, uh, you know, it, it was funny. I was like, man, like, you were thrown down. Like, I was, was what, you're throwing <laughs> down, you know. That's awesome. Um, so a lot of that stuff, like, you know, he he would actually just just have you sit in. He, it, would, it would be a lot of the, you know, um, uh, how would I put that, like, Different than going seeing a show where you're actually seeing your the the you know your mentor play, it was like yeah, it was kind of a little bit looser. Like, well, hey, you gonna sit in? You want to sit in, or or, or, sure. or is it okay if Rob sits in? You know that kind of thing. And and yeah, um, I think that was a a really you know nice thing to do for students. I know I've done it a few times for my students, um, but I think that's something that you really. You know, it's such a great thing to have, you know, op- an opportunity to, to have happen to you, right? Yeah. And then and then play yeah. in, in a situation, you know, where you're nervous and yeah. and all that. I don't know if you've ever done that, but, you know, it could be pretty I've had nerve-wracking. A few, yeah, a few experiences like that where you're sitting in on something and it's like, there's like people who aren't associated with you guys here who are paying customers who are or who are here to like have a drink and relax not to see like someone, you know, kind of flub around on the drums. So there's the pressure of like, this is real. This isn't like a practice experience. So I'm sure you felt better after being done with it. And we're glad that you did it and got that experience. And, uh, you know, it's a shame you didn't get to see the rest of Peter Erskine playing though, you know? Yeah. I mean, um, I got to say that I saw him over in Berkeley with, uh, the, his trio and the bass player was at, uh, carpenter what's his first name anyway the bass player uh he just passed away right like after that performance like shortly after that mm. and man that was so musical um wow. oh yeah it was uh, uh alan pasqua who actually played on the tony williams believe it albums mm. and uh straight ahead stuff just beautiful and erskine just like great touch you know yeah. tasty you know um didn't 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 overplay. You could play very simply, but just, you know, uh, wow, that was amazing. Yeah. You know, yeah. just seeing that stuff. So he's, he's, I think another, uh, even though I didn't get to study with my student did, but I think he's another like master that grew up in the same way. He was playing drums when he was five years old, you know, sure. doing the Stan Ketten stuff, um, uh, taking lessons with Gene Krupa, like all this stuff happened. You know, when they're in their, in like their, you know, at, what do you call it? Five years old, six years old. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, like all these crazy. opportunities. Yeah. You know, that shaped their life, you know. Yeah. Monster player. He, he, Peter Erskine, it'd be cool to do a biography episode on him or something just, or an interview with Peter uh, on the podcast, but uh, who knows, maybe down the road. But, um, well, Rob, this is just awesome, again, to have a glimpse into this this time and your experience with Mike Clark. So um, we'll keep talking a little bit here, but just thanks for putting this all together. And I guess thank you for, you know, to Mike Clark, if he's watching or listening to this, for letting you share these examples because you were did, you did the right thing and got kind of clearance for everything. So I'm glad he, he shared it with us. Um, but as we close things out here, why don't you kind of tell people about your drum studio, where they can find you, taking lessons with you. You're very close to getting uh, 500 subscribers on YouTube, so we're going to try and push that. So if you're listening to this, go to the link in the description to Rob's YouTube channel, subscribe. But um, So tell them where they can find you and uh, maybe take lessons with you. Yeah, so we just did um, a whole new uh, lesson series on a new platform. So um, we have online lesson courses available on um, all these different subjects. I've spent hours and hours and hours compiling, you know, my my online lessons, um, and that's on robhartdrumstudio.com. And then um, people can also take uh, Zoom lessons from me, so I'm offering that as well. And if they're in the area, they can stop by my studio and take private lessons with me. Cool, cool. And as we discussed in the 
previous one, when you're taking lessons with Rob, you're getting kind of, uh, he has all this knowledge from these great drummers um, that gets, you know, filtered down through Rob and you get his experiences and then you learn uh, everything uh, from, from Rob. So again, everyone, uh, you can check out Rob Hart Drum Studio dot com h a r t uh check out his youtube channel i'll put the link in the description for this and let's get him over that uh 500 subscriber mark and um and yeah rob i appreciate you taking the time to do all this and put these together and come back on the show it's always a pleasure to hear these old recordings this is kind of your special uh category of episodes that we do here so um uh thank you first to mike clark for sharing, you know, letting you do this and share his information and everything and, and his his uh, clips of the lessons. But yeah, Rob, I appreciate you being here, man. And Bart, I've got to thank you for this this history thing that you're just you're tearing the you're just tearing everything open. I mean, I've learned so much, <laughs> and I'm actually just verbatimly just I could just go back and like I I could be the dictionary and go, oh yeah, well this, then this is when this happened. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, the pasty good. symbol, like I can go, my friend had pasty symbols. Oh, well, here's the history of that. Because well, how did you know all that? <laughs> so I just think that um, just your podcast, I mean, the Simmons drums, you know, that whole thing. That was a cool and, one. And and and, and uh, just all this history of, of, of the instrument, you know, and the players and everything. It's just so incredible. And you do such a great job of it. I mean, and, thank and you. Your, your podcast is so professional. It sounds so great. And now you're doing the the YouTube video, so man, it's it's just taken off. It's just so awesome. So thank well, you. Well, I appreciate that, and it, it's it's good to have it as a like. I just I'm working on currently as I'm as we're talking, like every night I'm editing the Lars Ulrich series of gear, and uh, I've had a couple people say that man, I wish this existed 20 years ago, and I think it's neat to find people like in that example, Chris Ruscio, who's doing it, or like you, who's sharing this knowledge where. Uh, it's all in one place. And I think that's the best thing is I can, you know, find all you guys who are, who are doing this stuff and share it. So people have the access to the knowledge. Cause I enjoy that. I enjoy bugging my wife or friends or whoever with random facts about things and history lessons. And, uh, I'm glad I, I appreciate that a lot coming from you. That means a lot. So, uh, thank you, Rob. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. <laughs>